Okay, so in section 1.5, um, make sure you can do percents, which is you always divide and multiply by 100. And then uh, relative frequency is when, like, I give you a chart, like, say, the number of kids in a, in a bunch of households in a neighborhood, like zero kids, one kids, two, three, four, five, six, and more. And then this is the frequency, so how many households have two households have no kids, two have one kid, and so forth. And then relative frequency is just a fancy word for percent. So you're just going to find each of the percents for these, and you should be good to go. And then the second one, um, there's going to be a chart, so make sure you can do probability, which probability is the number of chances, kind of what you want or what you're talking about over the total number of chances. Um, and then also conditional probability when you have to change the denominator because you know additional information. So try to find the probability of someone being female in this study, probability that the person drinks more than three cups of coffee a day in this study, and then the probability that someone drinks two cups of coffee given that I know for sure they're female. So try those. Again, pause the video, actually do it, and then we'll talk about it. Okay, so to find relative frequency, first of all, you got to get the total here of how many people. So if you add this up, there are 20 total people. And again, to get percents, you take the part out of the total, part out of total, part out of total, part out of total, part out of total, and so forth. Um, and then you would divide these and multiply by 100. Um, or you could scale up by 5 and 5 to get out of 100, but like 15%. Um, 10 percent and again divide and multiply by a hundred so 25 percent uh, let's see this one's what 20 percent 10 percent 5 percent 5 percent and 15 percent so again you can either divide and multiply by 100 or the because 20 is a nice number you could scale it up by five and five but all of these percent should add up to a hundred percent so relative frequency is just a fancy word for percent all right, let's look at this one. Again, you need to get your total. So it looks like 10 people here. What is that, 11? So 20, 6, 8, 5, and 11. So what is that, 19? Yep. And so this is a good double check. These are the same people. So it should add up to 30 both ways. All right, so what's the probability that I get a female name? So there's no condition on here. So that means I'm looking at all 30 people. And I just want to know what's the probability of getting a female in that sample. So there's 20 of them. So again, you can divide and multiply by 100, or if it asks for a fraction, you could scale it down and have a fraction. Otherwise, this is 66.6 .6 repeating percent. All right, what's the probability that they drink more than three cups of coffee? Again, there is no condition on this. So you put 30, and more than three cups of coffee would be, what, 11 people? So 11 out of 30, and again, you could divide, multiply by 100 to convert that to a percent. Um, the next one, what's the probability that they drink given? Okay, so in if you take a stat class, you're going to not see the word given. They're just going to do that line thing. But given that this is a fact, so this is for sure going to happen, um, I know that they are female. So if I know for sure that I have a female's name, I'm not going to look at the behaviors of any of the males because I know it's a female. And that's going to change my denominators. So the fact that I know I'm only looking at females changes my denominator to 20. And of those, how many drink two cups of coffee? So that would be these people. So six females out of 20. Again, you can divide and multiply by 100, or you could scale down or up or whatever you want to do there. Um, so if I multiply this by 5 and this by 5, I get 30 out of 100. So that's 30%. But again, if you divide, multiply by 100, you'll still get 30%. All right, so that's the big ideas from section 1.5. Again, I do a few of those problems um, in the book to practice. All right, let's move on. Okay, in 1.6, there's a lot of vocab. So on the bottom of page 41, I would read through that. Um, make sure you know that, for example, like 8 and a negative 8 are opposites. So, um, you know, a half and a negative 1 half are opposites. Um, also, no absolute value. So absolute value is the distance from 0. So like if I give you the absolute value of 8, that's a distance of 8 from 0. Um, negative 8 has the same. So if you add negative 8, it's a distance of 8. So it's kind of like how powerful it is, but it has no sign. Um, 
it's usually positive, but if you have the absolute value of zero, you're going to get zero. And zero is neutral. It's not positive or negative. Um, nice positive negative numbers are called integers. So like eight and a negative eight are called integers or six or negative six or three or zero or one or, you know, two. Those are all integers. Um, when you get into fractions, then we're talking about rational numbers. Um, ratios because they're fractions so rational numbers so integers are nice positive negative numbers so I think that's about it in this section maybe ordering things like um, negative 8 and maybe like 200 um, I'd rather have $200 and a negative 8 um, if I had negative 8 and negative 7 I'd rather be $7 in debt than $8 in debt and if you graphed it on a number line here's 0 negative seven the more you go to the left the more negative you get um, if I put an absolute value on there so negative eight absolute value negative seven then which has a bigger distance so the answer is to this is eight and seven so that would be greater than that so mainly vocab on that a few like ordering on a number line things like that all right let's look at one seven um, I'm gonna pause here so again just kind of brush up our vocab and stuff there Okay, for section 1.7, you might want to read the vocab again in this section, especially that on the bottom page. I think it's 51. So maybe read the different types of numbers. And then, oh, I don't know what happened there. I guess, where are we? There we are. And then go ahead and fill in the blanks for these right here. And um, then fill in the blanks to those problems over there. So um, I need to adjust my screen a little bit there we go so fill in read the vocab brush up on that fill in the blanks here and then I will come back okay so with the vocab here um, make sure like natural numbers or counting numbers are the ones that go one two three four da, da. no decimals no fractions um, whole numbers start with zero that it has a hole in it so that's fitting and then one two three, four, da, da, da. And then integers, you know, eight, negative eight, two, positive two, zero, things like that. Rational numbers have your fractions, your decimals, plus everything else. Um, and then real numbers are kind of the big kind of number system that we're using all the time. And those include like square root of eight and pi and numbers like that. All right. Let's fill in the blank here. So these would be like where you can use a calculator, but it's not going to help you as much. So if I'm in debt, $3, a debt of $5 would give me a debt of 8 And again, I'd probably check it on a calculator. Um, I have $2, but I'm going to end up with more money. So if I take away money, that wouldn't make sense. So I need to take away debt. So, and again, you can check your calculator. 2 minus negative 3 does give you 5 here I'm in debt and I'm going to have money, so I need like nine bucks to pay off my bills and have some left. Um, a negative, if it pairs up, then it would be positive, so I need the nine, but I also need to be positive, so I need negative three there. Here I need them to pair up and I need it to equal 10, so uh, negative 40 divided by 40 divided by 4 is 10, and then if these pair up, it's positive. So again, kind of make sure you can do those. Um, a negative times a negative is always going to be positive because they're always going to pair up and if you're not sure just do a bunch of examples and see what happens um, a positive times a negative so if i positive times a negative um, it's always going to be negative because it won't pair up so this is always going to be negative so make sure you can do those type of problems um, i would do the problem like the story problems with temperature um, and let's see what else um, yeah, maybe like problem number nine on page 55 would probably be a good idea too. So look over that section. All right, I'm going to pause and then we'll talk about 1.8. Okay, in section 1.8, make sure you can find the mean and the average or midpoint. So to find the mean, yes, you know, you could just add them up. So you could add up and get 12 divided by three items gives you an average of four. But it's also good to understand like steal from the rich, give to the poor. So I could steal from here, give it to here so that they're all the same. So then, like, if I have, say, three quiz scores, a 10, an 8, and a 6, and I want to know what grade I need to get on the last one to, say, get a, say, my goal is to get a 9 out of 9 average, okay? So I could guess and test. So I could, you know, try 10, try 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 till I get it. Or I could understand that if it's an average of 9, they all would be 9. 
So I could steal from the rich, give to the poor. So like I could steal from that guy and give it to that guy. Um, that means this last test has to have three extra to give to this six to make it a nine. So that means I'd have to get a 12. So unless there's a lot of extra credit, if there's only 10 points total, probably not going to happen. Um, the other option is to, if everything's a nine, that would be 36 points total. Subtract the points you have. And then you would need 12 on that last exam. So understanding average is key. Um, as far as midpoint goes, um, you know, it's that's all you're doing. You're averaging. So if I give you 2, negative 8, and say 6, 10, you're averaging the x's to find the point in the middle. So 2 plus 6 is what? 8 divided by 2 is 4. And then you're averaging the y's. So negative 8 plus 10 would be you would have what two dollars divided by two is one um so so again midpoint this would be the midpoint and you could graph them and look at you know like you could go to negative eight and you could go over six ten and you should be able to graph it and kind of see that that's accurate all right so make sure you can do that again i would look at some of the story problems in here involving kind of the stealing from the rich giving to the poor type questions and then maybe end point Okay, 1, 9 and 1, 10 are dealing with all types of graphs. So 1, 9, if you're going to do like part to part, remember you're probably going to want to do a bar graph. Um, and then make sure you have, you know, labels here, uh, labels here, a title, um, consistent units as far as frequency goes here. Um, a line graph would be like the stock market or my weight showing change over time. So again, that would be connected. Um, a pie chart shows um, part to whole. So, for example, if you have, um, I don't know, maybe like 10 people um, like chocolate and maybe 20 people like vanilla and 30 people, or let's say another 20 people like some other flavor of ice cream. Um, so what you do is convert them to percents. So there's, what, 50 people total, so 10 out of 50. Divide, multiply would be 20%. And then remember to get the degrees, you would use that percent times 360 degrees. And so that would be about, what, 72 degrees. So 90 degrees would be here, so maybe 72. And I would put chocolate and label it with, what, 20%. And then vanilla, I'd take 20 divided by 50, multiply by 100. And so that's like, what, 40? Is that right? 40%? Yeah. So then I would take 40% of 360, get my angle, and then draw it, and then do the other one. So vanilla would be 40%, and other would be 40%. Okay, so make sure you can do all of those. Um, and then read information off a graph would be super helpful. Um, so again, I would look over that section a little bit, not as heavy as some, but you still need to be able to do it. All right, and then in 110, um, I'm going to pause for a second, and then we'll finish up with 110. Okay, so make sure you can do a scatter plot. So tell me what the independent and dependent variable are, graph it, and then tell me what kind of correlation it is, positive or negative, and then also give me what that means specifically to this science experiment where you're timing so many seconds and then you're doing the temperature. So graph, independent, dependent, what type of correlation is it, and then what does that mean? Okay, so remember with independent and VBAR, um, independent, dependent, it's always independent, it spells the word ID, and I won't turn these around. So independent is the seconds, dependent is the temperature because I have control over how many seconds I let the experiment go on and then the temperature is a result of that. Okay, so um, since these were going by ones, I went ahead and went by ones here. Again, this has to be zero, zero. You can't change that. And then numbers have to get bigger as they go out because this is, I mean, it's really an XY axis. So you have to kind of, even though you're not doing all parts, it has to be consistent. Since these went down by fives, I went up by five. So 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. Um, so then I plotted my 40 and then at one and so forth. And so this is a nice linear um, situation here. It is going, uh, it's going down. So it's a negative correlation. And basically as the time is going up, my temperature is decreasing 
And in the new section one, we could actually write a formula for that. Um, my starting temp is 40. I keep losing five all the time over and over again, and I could put 